he should have been a vegetable or dead. In fact, my guest's heart stopped. Medical records say he had cardiac arrest for one hour and 45 minutes. He died and went to heaven. Today, he's called the miracle man, having been supernaturally healed of 29 conditions. Hello, Sid Roth here. Welcome to my world where it's naturally supernatural. But this, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Dean and Marilyn Brankston, Dean, you are saying that your heart stopped beating for one hour and 45 minutes, and you're talking to me like a sane man right now? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Okay, let, let, let's kind of take you back a bit. Uh, May 4th, 2006, uh, you're minding your own business. You're, uh, what type of work do you do? Well, at that time, I was what they call a supervisor for the Juvenile Justice Department up there near Seattle, King County. And I supervised um, two specialty courts. One was called Drug Court, one was called Treatment Court. And I worked in the juvenile justice system. So that's what I was doing at the time. Okay, what happened to you that day? Well, that day I woke up early in the morning and I had a pain on my right side. I already knew it was kidney stones because I had them in the past mm -hmm. about four years earlier. And I went on to work any old way because I figured when I get to work, I could work through it. It would pass. I've had that happen before. But going to work, I found out this time it was not getting any better. It seemed to get really worse. I decided to let the people know at work that I needed to go home. I figured I would go ahead and... Um, and uh, pass them at home when I got home, but it seemed to get worse. And I finally decided to go to the emergency room or the local hospital. Went there, told the people there that um, I believe I have kidney stones. That day, for some reason, can't tell you why, there was no one else in that emergency room. I looked at that as a miracle in itself. They rushed me back in the back room, gave me some medication, and then called my wife. Now, Marilyn, you've been in the health field. You're a health professional for some 34 years. Correct. So yes. you understand what's happening. You get out to the hospital, and, and they make a decision to, what, what do they do, blast uh, the kidney stones? Yes, they're uh, going to take a machine and, and, and just blast those kidney yeah. stones, break them up so they so, can pass them. So, so he has the procedure. They're blasted. But then you find out he has an infection. What does that mean? That means that along with the kidney stones, that infection is, is really bad, and it's built up around the kidney stones, too, and, uh, and, and thereby he had to be on several ana you know, different antibiotics and things. D did you realize how serious this was? That I didn't it was life-threatening? Not at all, because he ended up with the procedure being done and spent 13 days in the hospital, and nine of those days was in the intensive care unit. Well, tell me about the time that you walked out uh, and the doctor, the surgeon, calls you on the cell phone. What did he say? Well, I walked out and then I, just, I decided I was going to go home and uh, bring some things and stay overnight with him. And when I was no longer more than two blocks down the street in my car, the doctor calls me on the phone and he says, Marilyn, uh, your husband's heart stopped. And right now, as we speak, they're doing CPR on him, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. I'm going to take you back to that moment. Yes. He hangs up. What do you do? Now you know how serious it is. Yes, now I know how serious <laughs> it is. And you know what, Sid? I, you know, I believe it just was an act of God, and I, I just had faith. I, I continued to go home. I didn't turn the car around and go back home, but I called my son and daughter. Both of them were away in college, and I called up friends and just started asking everyone to pray, just pray. And uh, when I got to, to my house, a young lady came over and picked me up, a real good friend of ours, and we got back to the hospital and wasn't able to see Dean for a long while because they were still working on him. Now, when he came back to and by the way, you know what all of this is right here. Oh, yes. Those These are medical are, records and transcripts. How many conditions did he have when he came back to life? Well. <laughs> some, some, something like uh, 29, it 29, says in my notes. Yes. And, and here is the medical verification of this. Mm -hmm. What I want to know is what happened to you when you died. 
We all want to know that. <laughs> what happened? Well, say because, you know, I accepted Jesus Christ or the Messiah into my life, I'm born again. I want to be where the Father and Jesus is. No, no, no. How did you get? You're, you're there, dead, dead. Uh, they're trying to get you back to life. Mm -hmm. What is your first memory? My first memory is, is, is moving as fast as I can to be where Jesus and the Father is. People ask me sometimes how fast that is, and I always bring them back to what the Bible says, to be absent from the body is to be in the presence of the Father, you know, or be in the presence of Christ. I was moving so fast that be, before you can blink, I was there. That's mm -hmm. how fast. That's my first memory. Also, that what was passing me by as I was moving was the prayers that people were praying for me and others. I say this, if you were praying that day, your prayers passed me by at that moment. Just out of curiosity, do you have a greater appreciation for prayer? Oh, yes. By having seen, oh, yes. just see, could you picture looking at people's prayers just zoop, going <laughs> right up like that? And you got to remember how fast I was moving. You know, that, as the Bible That's said, fast. Fast. As, you, as you were just blinking right there, I was in the presence of the Lord. And yet the prayers that people were praying for me and others. And I always put that in there because I want people to know it was just not the prayers that were for me. But I saw prayers that were coming from this planet, from other people, pass me by like I was standing still. Just out of curiosity, uh, obviously your wife and your, your, your family were praying for mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. um, did you know it at the time? Did you see it at the time? Well, I knew they were praying for me because those prayers that were going by me, I, I literally knew what those prayers were. You know, I, I literally knew what they were praying. They were, you know, my wife was praying that, that I would not only be healed, but that I would come back and be alive, that I wouldn't die. That was her prayers. You know, that was my children's prayers. That was the prayers of the, of the family members. You know, but there were also prayers that were going past me for people that were praying for their loved ones. And they were praying that their loved ones, the same thing, that healing take place or our situation would change. But the prayers that really got me that were going by me was the ones that were praying for their loved ones to come to know Jesus as the Messiah, as the Lord and Savior. You know, one of the things that his book did for me is I understand how things operate from heaven to earth and what God expects us to be doing here so much better as a result of reading the book. Don't go away. We're going to find out some amazing experiences. For instance, he was shocked who was not in heaven and who was in heaven. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Hello, Sid Roth here with Dean Braxton and Dean you're dead, dead, dead. <laughs> now we're in 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you instantly leave your body because you, you know the Lord, right. and you find yourself in heaven. Right. Who was the first person you saw in heaven? Well, when I first got there, I was at the feet of Jesus. And I can remember looking at him and saying these things to him, Sid. I said, you did this for me? And then all I could say was, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And at that moment, I came to really understand that the only reason I was there is what, because of what Jesus Christ had done. It wasn't because of what I had done, but what he had done. And then I came to realize even the works I, I did in life, even the works I'm doing right now, is him working through me. So I couldn't even take credit for those things. And all I could say is, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I tell people everything about me. My body wasn't there. It was my soul and my spirit. That's what was there. Everything about me was praising him. And I tell people if I didn't open up my mouth and praise him, everything else would have kept on praising him. I could not stop thanking him. What did his eyes look like? Oh, his eyes are, are, you know, they're just like what we read in the Bible, the fiery red and different colors. But what got me about his eyes is I literally saw the love for me, like I was the only creation of his that he loved. Knowing that he loved everyone else, knowing that he loves you and everyone else on this planet, but I came to understand that in his eyes, when he looks at me, he loves me like I'm the only creation that he loves. People got to really understand that. Sometimes we don't understand the deepness of his love for us. It's a different type of love. Than it's human a deep and Yes, yes. It was created just for me. The love for you is created just for you. So I can't take his love away from that he has for you away from you, and you can't take his love he has for me away from me. His love that he has for you, understand this, Sid, is created literally for you.
Tell me about when you would just look at a part of his body, like his feet. Oh, when I looked at his feet, what I'm talking about, this love that's created just for me, if I didn't see another part of him and his feet, just like it's said in Revelation, if you read it, and it talks about his feet looking like brass, it's really the, the glow off of it that looks like brass. You got the nail print still there, but that's what didn't get me about his feet. What got me about his feet is that his feet love me. And what I mean by that, if I didn't look at any other part of him, if I didn't see any other thing but his feet, I would have experienced the fullness of his love for me through his feet. Same thing happened with his hands. Same thing happened with his entire body. Any part of his body I looked at, his hair, the crown on his head, everything that I looked at literally screamed out how much he loves me. Like I was the only thing in all creation he loved. Knowing that he loves everyone else, but that creative love that he had created just for me was coming through him in such a way. I, it, 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 it seemed like I was literally turning into that love as he was looking at me. Someone asked me one time, they said, did you need any food? No. As I was receiving that love, I was being fulfilled in every manner you could imagine. In the sense, even in the sense of saying, I'm no, I wasn't hungry. I didn't need anything. That was satisfying me much more than I could ever explain to you. Now, you saw some loved ones that had died yes. and gone to heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, who was the first loved one you saw? Oh, the first one I saw was my grandmother, Mary. And I, you know, I have to tell you, before this happened to me, I didn't think that that would be that important to the Lord, that you would really see your family members there. But when I got there, Jesus was standing to the uh, um, left of me about 10 or 11 o'clock to the left of me. And past him on the other side was my grandmother Mary. Not only my grandmother Mary was there, but other family members that had accepted Jesus Christ as the Messiah as Lord and Savior, they were there. And it was something. It wasn't just the ones I knew, but generation after generation after generation <laughs> after generation of those that had accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior that helped to make this man who I am on this planet right now, they were there to greet me in the heaven. I mean, I tell people you will have the biggest family reunion you would ever think of. Now, what did your grandmother say to you? My grandmother said something to me, said really two things to me. One thing she wanted me to know, and Jesus said the same thing, that this was not my home and that I'm just passing through. That's what one of the things that Jesus Christ really wants me to get across to people as I talk to them. You're just passing through this. You are not staying on this planet. The other thing grandma said to me, which has really impacted me really greatly, when Jesus was telling me to leave, she said to me, she said, bring as many of us back with you as you can. And I came back with an understanding of how important family is to God. And, and, and it seems like you should have known that beforehand. But see, I had accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I was the first one in my family. The rest of my family, my immediate family, of three brothers and a, and a dad and a mother, they didn't come to know Jesus Christ when I came to know Jesus Christ. Ten years later, my mom accepted Jesus Christ. And so it was only me and her that were what we would call Christians at the time. The rest of them, no. And here I am, I had separated myself, not only in the sense of, uh, of uh, spiritually or uh, physically, but I also moved all the way up to Seattle, and they all lived in California. And I had very little to do with them. And here's my grandma saying to me, bring as many of us back with you as you can. And I have a renewed um, understanding of going back and making sure my family members know about Jesus Christ. How important is family to God? Oh, it's very important, even to the point that when you, we don't look at it that way sometimes, but that's why the devil's attacking the family and tearing up the family. I think if you, if you look at even the Jewish families, and I'm going to bring this in here because I think it relates so closely to Jewish families and, and how uh, uh, keeping that bloodline as the Jewish people try to keep that bloodline pure because they understood how important family was to God. We sometimes have gotten away from that. Still, God is saying the same thing to everyone that comes to know him as Lord and Savior. Your family is important to me and so much that I literally want you to go back to your family and make sure they know who I am. I really believe that each and every one of us that are born again, that if we go back just to our family, and reach out to them. We'll, we'll be ministering and evangelizing more people than we'll ever come to understand. Have you reached 
more of your family since oh, you've since, been back? Yes, I have. I've reached out to my brothers. My dad came to know Jesus Christ about a year and a half ago. You know, he's 78 years old now, and so um, good, good father. But he made that commitment. He says he's a believer now. Do you know how much joy that brings me? We're not only... But how much joy does it bring the Lord? Oh, how much joy does it bring the Lord? I was there when people got born again. I was there when people asked Jesus Christ or the Messiah to what, be their what Lord. What happens in heaven when you see someone born again on earth? When I was there, um, what happened was literally their name is shouted from one end of heaven to the other. Oh, I didn't ask you the most important question, the shock he had of who wasn't in heaven and the <laughs> shock he had of who was there. We'll be right back after this word. Hello, Sid Roth here with Dean Braxton, and this is so fascinating. You see, Dean died. His, his, his heart literally stopped for one hour and 45 minutes, and he went to heaven. And one of the things you said is you were shocked on who was there and who wasn't there. Yeah. You had your own opinion, but God had a different one. God had a different opinion. You know, because when I got there, I looked and I saw many people that I thought would not make it there. And then I looked around and I said, but there's people that I thought would make it here that is not here. And I came to understand a lot of those people that were not there, that I thought were there, were people that were, we would call them pastors, leaders in, our, in churches, our, uh, in ministries. Um, but they weren't there. And, you know, when I came back, I really pondered on that. Why, Lord, weren't these men or these women there that you would think that would be there? And here are people that I would thought, no, they didn't make it into heaven, and yet they were there. I came to understand because of what happened to me with one of my own family members, uh, my Aunt Barbara. She was there. Aunt Barbara was a lady that I would have told you even to this day if I didn't have this experience in my life. She didn't make it there. She did not go there. She went to hell. That's what I would have told you because of the lifestyle that she lived that I saw in front of me. And the, the uh, last two years of her life, I was not around her. And so I didn't see the last two years of her life. So I was basing it on everything up to that point. But you said you were looking for men of God, pastors that weren't there. Why wouldn't a pastor that's preaching the gospel, why wouldn't he be there? It's the same thing I was going to say about Ann Barber, just to let you know, Sid. It's a hard thing. It really is a hard thing. God knew my Aunt Barbara's heart. She must have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, or the Messiah as Lord and Savior, because that's the only way you got in, is by knowing him. These men or these women of God that we would think that know Jesus Christ, he knows their hearts. He, they are not fooling him. He knows exactly what they're thinking. He knows why they're doing it. He knows the motives behind it. See, everything in heaven's motive is to get people to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior on this planet. Remember I told you earlier there was even this strategy piece that was going I know. Going. I'm fascinated by that. Tell me. In, in other words, he literally saw Jesus strategizing on how to win souls. Tell me. Describe one thing you saw about the strategy. Well, you've got to understand that the strategy or the, or the prompting for the strategy comes from us praying on this planet. We don't understand that sometimes, but even Jesus Christ said that we're to pray that more laborers go into the field. Well, we sometimes pass that by. But that, when he said that, that's a reality because God's going to move off of our prayers that are from the heart. And literally these prayers would go to the Father. He would communicate to Jesus. Jesus had around him a number of what I call beings, being everything that God created them to be. Some had been redeemed. Some of them we would have called angels. But they were there, and he would communicate with them about plans that he had on how to get someone on this planet moved in a direction to accept him as Lord and Savior. I can remember him looking at them. And when he would look at them, they literally would bow before him, not take their eyes off him, and back out and go and do their, 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 their assignment. Now, I came to understand, he wasn't looking at them so much as what the strategy should be, because they were obeying him. They were not back-talking or coming up with a different plan. What he was looking at is this planet. He was seeing down here who would fulfill their piece of the part of the strategy on this planet. The closest I can come to any example would be like Saul when he was talking to Saul and he told Saul to go wait and then Ananias told Ananias to go and talk to Saul. Remember Ananias when he first uh, talked to him said, oh, wait a minute, do you know who this is? Many people on this planet, when the Lord is telling them to do something, they balk at it or they reject it. And he's saying, okay, I can't count on them. I got to find somebody else. 
you know, and he goes and tries to find someone else. That's what the strategy is about. You know what it about. reminds me of Catherine Coleman? She shared the story. She had the greatest miracle ministry of her generation. She shares the story that God selected many men for that miracle ministry, and they all turned God down. Now, I'm sure he didn't say, I want to give you a miracle ministry, and the, the man did say, well, I don't want it. But just step by step, because God leads you. All these men turn God down. So, uh, so Catherine said, I was the bottom of the barrel, but I said yes. Yes. Tell me you know, something you saw about strategy, where they were strategizing for a particular part of the world. Well, you know, um, one of the places I saw really, I saw when I was there, you could see where the prayers were coming from. You could literally see prayers coming from this planet into heaven. And literally, I could say, this area's got this much of a percentage of prayers, maybe 1 in 10. You had anywhere from maybe a 1 to a 10 coming from this planet. Where one of the areas I saw a lot of prayers coming from was what we call the, the, the Far East, you know, around the Is Asia, that why so many Muslims are having dreams oh, yes, and visions yes, of Jesus? Yes, yes. That's all part of the That's strategy? That's all part of the strategy. He is reaching out to that part because of the prayers coming from that area. And in the sense that I saw him look at hmm. these beings, and part of these beings are, were, were Peter and James. He looked at his, their group, and li literally several of those angels, we would call, left their group to head down to that part of, the, of our planet. Tell me about worship. Oh, worship. You know, it, there's so much. Everything there worships the Lord. I came to understand what true worship is, and that is doing the will of the Father. Anytime you're doing the will of the Father, you're worshiping Him. When I was there, there was a time that I saw before what I call praise before the throne of God. And every creation of God literally was sending up prayers or, or praise to the Father in such a way they were individual. Every, every, it wasn't like a group uh, praise. It would be like you're praising the Lord individually. I'm praising the Lord individually. And it did not clash. What, what is the biggest impact that happened in, to you as a result of going to heaven? The biggest impact was seeing the love that the Father has for us. When during that praise time, I literally saw him sing back to every, every creation. I even say now when we're praising him or giving him glory that he literally is singing back to us. That's what I believe that when we say the glory of God's here, I really believe it's his singing to us. That's what we're experiencing. That changed me because I came to understand how much the Father really loves us. You know how the Bible says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son? Yes, that's reality. He loves us that much. Okay, I have all these pages here of conditions you were healed of. Uh, your wife tells me that the hospital calls you the miracle man. You were mm -hmm. healed of mm -hmm. 29 different conditions. When you came back, who was the first person that saw you, and what was their reaction quickly? Well, the first person that saw me was a friend of mine. He had been working at the hospital. He matter, matter of fact, he worked on the breathing machines, and he was one of those that was helped taking the tube out of my mouth. His name was Anthony Jordan. I looked at him, and I said, you know, you know I have seen Jesus. You don't have to hope I've seen Jesus. You don't have to <laughs> wish I've seen Jesus. You know I've seen Jesus. And he's a big man, and tears were just coming mm -hmm. down from his face. I said, you go tell your church, because he had been a pastor of a church also. I said, you go tell your wife, Monique. You go tell. We don't have to hope there is a Jesus. Love your family. Love God. You can't love God if sin is separating you from God. The only way you can remove sin is to believe that Jesus died in your place because he loved you for your sin. This is God's moment, God's moment for you to get right with God. Make Jesus your Lord. Tell him you're sorry for your sins. Ask him to live inside of you now.